So thank you for coming. Um, I work for uh, RBC, just a few uh, floors upstairs. Uh, I run what we call the Center of Excellence for blockchain. Um, it's a fancy name. It's really a bunch of extremely motivated blockchain geeks, a bunch of distributed systems geeks that sit on a lab just a few floors above you. Uh, and all of us, uh, we think we've basically won the career lottery here. Um, we actually get paid to do this. Um, today, I want to give you a flavor of uh, what we do, uh, what banks are doing with blockchain. There's nothing complicated about what I'm going to say. Um, uh, there, there's, uh, it, it's really something anyone can understand. It's just sort of something very light to give you a flavor for what we do in banking around blockchain. Um, there's a lot of questions around why banks are in blockchain in the first place, and hopefully I'll, an I'll be able to answer some of those. We are going to talk about three things today. The first is, sorry. Okay, got that right. The first thing we're going to talk about is why banks are interested in blockchain. The second thing we're going to talk about is what banks are actually doing, what, what they are exploring using this technology. Uh, and finally, um, this is something I truly believe, um, a little plug on why you may want to partner with or work in a bank if you're working on blockchain. Uh, I often get uh, a lot of people coming uh, to us saying, uh, we love what you do, but we don't want to work in a bank, and hopefully that last piece will address some of that. Um, I'm going to jump right in. Does anyone recognize the statement? Yes? That's right. Uh, could you say that a little loudly, please? Right. So this really is the white paper by uh, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto around 2009. Uh, and you probably want to pay attention to the last six words. Um, essentially, he says, without going through a financial institution. Um, so it's a little ironic to be sitting inside a bank, working for a bank, and talking about blockchain, when the guy who wrote the original paper was trying to put us out of a job. But uh, le let me tell you why we're really interested in blockchain. Um, I I'm going to refer you to the definition that the crypto chicks provided a little while ago. Uh, a, a summary of that really is blockchain helps you build trust machines. Essentially, when two people want to transact and they don't trust each other, you can evolve a system, we'll call it a blockchain, where both can put their trust into the system and now can transact fearlessly. That's really what blockchain brings to the table. It brings trust. In general, we know that the more trust we have, the lower the transaction costs. And this is kind of intuitive. Um, I'm sure there's some uh, bunch of economists who've proved this over and over again, but it's fairly intuitive that if you trust someone else, your transactions with those people are going to have a much lower cost than someone you don't trust. If you look at banking, if you look at what we really do uh, in aggregate, our operations, it's really a ton of transactions. That's really how banks operate day in and day out millions of transactions. So if you just connect the dots over here, banking and blockchain essentially lead to more efficient transactions. So in a nutshell, this is why banks really care about blockchain. We look at them fundamentally as private ledgers that increase the trust between the participants that we set them up for. And we hope that the cost of transactions goes down and the transactions themselves become more efficient. That's really, in a nutshell, why banks care about blockchain. Let's talk a little bit about what banks are actually doing using this technology. Most for-profit enterprises, and banks, as you know, are for-profit enterprises, care about three things. The first is an improved customer experience. The second is an improved bottom line, which is a way to essentially reduce your operational costs. And finally, the third is an improved top line, which is to say, can we get more revenue inside the organization? Can we go into new markets? Can we look at new business models? And I'll quickly walk you through a few use cases that banking industry is looking at for each of these. Uh, for the improved customer experience, 
uh, this is in the press a lot, uh, you will find almost every bank that is doing blockchain is looking at loyalty rewards. The way people look at rewards today is it's just a form of currency. Rewards are seen as just another form of currency, um, much like anything else you would buy or spend. And rewards are seen as a safe way to try out blockchain. So you'll find a lot of banks stepping into the rewards use cases, trying to figure out, can we really understand blockchain, the crypto token part of blockchain, by delving into the rewards part of it. Uh, RBC itself is doing some work in the space, uh, and it's been in the media. I'm, I'm sure you could Google it. Uh, the bottom line is what they're trying to do is figure out, can you actually earn a reward and burn it fairly quickly? Generally, when you earn a reward, it takes weeks before it posts to your statements and it's available for you to buy something. The hope is that blockchain will allow you to earn instantly, see the money instantly, see the rewards instantly, and also burn equally quickly. Let's look at improved bottom line. Um, again, um, I, I, I was quite heartened to see uh, the previous speakers talk about uh, remittances. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this audience has actually sent money from one place to another, done a wire transfer. Um, anyone who sent money across the globe uh, knows it's a fairly painful process. Uh, it's a time-consuming process, and often stuff just gets lost. Uh, and it takes a while to go find it and repair that transaction and make sure that your money went from source to destination as intended. Um, what this means for financial institutions is, one, you have a lot of intermediaries in the way money goes from A to B. Uh, let's say you're sending money from here to uh, a country in Asia like Indonesia. It's very common to have multiple hops over there. I'm just getting the one minute signal, so I'm going to hurry up. So um, uh, what blockchain essentially does is allow you to eliminate those hops, make it really quick, reduce the transaction costs, and remove all the intermediaries. So what would take three or four days in the past could settle in as much as one or two seconds now. That's the promise. Uh, let's talk about top line. Um, and I'll do this really fast uh, because I want to jump to my next slide and tell you why it's cool to come work at a bank. Uh, the whole point of the top line argument really is that the cost of transactions will come down significantly, that uh, new products and new markets can be explored uh, where it is not possible to do a viable business today. So a lot of the banking for the unbanked conversations. All right, so why you may want to work with a bank? Um, a lot of this is about technology. I, I find uh, today a lot of us are talking about technology, focusing on technology. Uh, but let's not lose sight of the fact that blockchain networks are fundamentally networks. The value in these networks is business value, so they're business networks. Banks have the unique ability and hundreds of years of experience in creating large-scale business networks. If you want to be doing something that moves the needle on blockchain, you probably want to partner with someone who's really good at setting up business networks. Technology is hard. Setting up the business networks way harder. Second, banks see themselves as enabled by technology increasingly. We see ourselves competing for technology talent with the best tech shops out there. You'll probably work with a phenomenal peer group, and you'll have the best SMEs in the industry support you should you come to work in NFI. Finally, in the non-public ledger space, and, and the quickest way to check this out is to type blockchain on a Google bar and just click on news. Mostly what you're going to see is financial institutions being super aggressive about blockchain POCs. Literally everything, internal projects, small bank consortia, large consortia, industry-wide stuff like Ripple, everything you can imagine is there. So that's why I think you may want to work with a bank or partner with a bank if you're serious about blockchain and serious about being in finance. Thank you. All right, we're going to open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions in the audience. Ah. Hi, my name is Fernando. Um, this was probably a question for you ladies too, but I'm going to bully the banker here. Um, so blockchain being primarily founded upon cryptography, it r its security relies on key management. How are banks dealing with that security problem? 
Um, so key management is not something uh, that's specific to blockchain. I, I think uh, the amount of e-commerce that flows through banks, the amount of sensitive data that we have, uh, I'd say we are among the best in just dealing with key management in general, irrespective of blockchain. Um, so my group recently did uh, 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 an application. We built a shadow ledger uh, between the US and Canada to track payments in real time. Um, we used basically the latest, um, you know, the best practices in the state of the art that was already available in the bank, and it's essentially industry best practices. We didn't do anything special for this because we were already there as a bank. Um, you know, we are highly regulated, we stick to best practices and so forth. Um, so I, I would actually uh, say that it's a separate orthogonal thing by itself, and banks are pretty good at that. We have to be. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, hi. Um, I. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, currently, we have um, like we have a central bank, uh, like an agreement between the banks to move money around, right? Uh, Bretton Woods and all that stuff. Is is this uh, blockchain going to change that? And is it going to create a new way of moving money around, um, whether it's financial institution or whatever parties, and then create a disruption into this agreement uh, on moving money? Like, are we talking about new Bretton Woods uh, blockchain type? Um, so I, I won't talk about uh, Bretton Woods and get into uh, that side of the argument, but I, maybe I can throw some light on uh, what's happening uh, in what we call the wholesale market in blockchain. Um, something like 90 countries in the world are actually engaged in uh, blockchain POCs, uh, where their central banks are act actively looking to see can they actually work with their uh, retail banks uh, using a cryptocurrency. So uh, a lot of countries are analyzing, some are actually doing POCs. The Bank of Canada is doing something called Project Jasper, which you can look at, uh, where they're trying to see, uh, can the wholesale uh, payments market be onboarded onto a chain? Uh, it's still very early days, it's still very experimental, um, and we don't know which direction that's going to go in, uh, but certainly there's a lot of work being done over there, and the implications aren't entirely clear at this point to anybody. It, it's a lot of experimental work right now. I think we had a question here. Hello, another question for the banker. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about Jasper project? Um, uh, I could, but I, I think it'll be just quicker to just Google that and download all the uh, details. I know. Like, is it also <laughs> experimental, or is it actually like uh, uh, yes. coming to it, life? It is, so? it is early uh, tests, and it is uh, experimental. It's the Bank of Canada with a few of the large Canadian banks. So. All right, you, you definitely you. want to download and read the white paper just to get a feel of what they're trying to do and where they are. There's also some learnings they've published, so pretty cool stuff. All right. If you're a banker. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Any other questions? One last one there. So would you say that uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum pose a threat to the banking institutions? And if so, would RBC or other major banks consider their own version of a cryptocurrency? Um, it's, it's hard to really make a call on that at this point. Um, it, it's, it's really difficult to say... Um, you know, if a cryptocurrency is going to be disruptive enough to pose a threat to a uh, established fiat-based monetary system, it, it's, I think, way too early in the game to say that. Um, you could look at some of the numbers. You could look at the market cap of Bitcoin. You could look at the market cap of Ethereum, for example. Um, uh, let, let's just look at Bitcoin around since 2009. Uh, you can take its market cap. I, I don't know what it is exactly now, 1700 billion. And you could look at something like just the daily remittances volumes uh, for payments across the world. And it would be something on the order of a rounding error. Um, that's not to say that it's not growing. That's not to say that it could not be disruptive or threatening in the future. Uh, but at this point, the numbers, I think, speak for themselves in terms of where fiat currencies are and where cryptocurrencies are. Uh, it's hard to say what the future is going to look like. Uh, and there's multiple forces at play. One is, uh, how are these currencies going to go? 
uh, forward, uh, who's uh, what and who is going to sustain them. Secondly, it's also going to be interesting to watch uh, how fiat currencies themselves get transformed into crypto because uh, a lot of central governments are looking at that. And if you have a fiat currency that's going to go crypto and you have something like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, you know, how do they compete? Uh, which kind of customer goes for what? It's, it's way too early to make a call on those things. Uh, but for now, uh, the way I look at it is I just look at the numbers um, and uh, they tell me a story. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a question here. Last question. Where did I hear that yeah, voice it's from? It's here. Hi. <laughs> um, I would like to understand a little bit more about the creation of the blocks, because my understanding, based on what um, the, uh, the first group of ladies discussed, is that uh, one of the cornerstones of blockchain is distributing the information and the creation of the blocks across multiple, multiple users um, and across the globe. So how I would like to understand how the banks will deal with this. Will the creation of the blocks be centralized or they're going to use the network of coders that exist, currently exist? Okay. Uh, so I can answer that uh, very quickly. So uh, when we build networks um, inside banks or for financial institutions, they continue to be decentralized networks, except the difference between them and something like Bitcoin or Ethereum is these are private in the sense that we control who can participate in them. But within those participants themselves, they're completely decentralized. So no one uh, peer, uh, no one participant can dominate the network. Uh, so I, I'd say that is the difference between a private ledger and a public ledger. All right. Thanks, Kiwi. <laughs>